Leah Penniman's book is dedicated to the African ancestors who, before being forced onto slave ships, braided seeds into their hair. That alone tells you how deep, albeit traumatic, the history of much American agriculture is and how resilient the people who made it flourish. Yet, the story of food and farming in the U.S. is not just one of neglect and extraction. It is also one of wisdom and liberation with practices that have intricate cultural roots. Leah is returning to the show with a new book, Farming While Black, with stories and applications that have her community at their center. She's the co-director of Soul Fire Farm, which we featured on the show back in 2015. Welcome back. I should say you haven't been in studio before. Well, now we get to see you not in the fields, not in Willie Boots. We're glad to have you. I know, there's no mud on me at all today. <laughs> Your book, and I should say the subtitle is gorgeous because it is a practical guide. Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land is dedicated to those ancestral grandmothers. Um, you want to tell us more about that and why you start that way? Just that dedication stopped me in my tracks. Mm. Well, the family story goes that our grandma's grandma's grandma, Susie Boyd, and many of the women in the community of the Dahomey region of West Africa, when everyone around them was being kidnapped and rounded up and they faced an uncertain future, they made a choice that astounds me uh, even in this moment. They decided to take the okra, the millet, the black rice, the cow peas that their families had saved for generations and to hide them in, the, in their braids because they didn't know where they were going, but they believed against odds in a future on soil and they believed in us, that we would exist and that they needed a legacy to pass on. And the reason I wanted to put that dedication forth is because in these challenging times, it's very easy to give up, to lose hope, just put Netflix on and chill, right? And I, and I have to be reminded that if they didn't give up on us, then who are we in much less dire circumstances to give up on our descendants? It's that act of creative bringing into being, which you must have done too. I mean, you didn't get born with this farm. No, definitely didn't. I was, didn't even grow up on a farm. I started farming when I was 16 years old. I got a job at the Food Project in Boston, Mass, because I needed a job. And I have to tell you, from that first moment of planting a carrot seed and seeing it all the way through to maturity and then chopping it up and serving it in a soup kitchen, I had found my way home. Yeah. Because being a rural, mixed black kid, very, very challenging to figure out who I was, whether I even merited being on this earth. And there was an elegant simplicity in the growing, the harvest, the sharing with community that whetted my passion for environmental stewardship and my concern for social welfare into this one sacred act. Mm. So I was totally hooked. I've been farming over 20 years. Uh, you know, Soul Fire, my husband and I joke that it's our third child because we give it at least as much love and time and attention as our two teenage children, Nishima and Emmett. And the land, how did it come into your care? Long story short, you know, we had a lot of trouble feeding our own children healthy food. Despite our college degrees, despite our knowledge of farming, you know, we had to walk over two miles to the nearest place to get fresh food. And our neighbors, when they found out we knew how to farm, there was a clamor. You know, you need to start a farm for the people. I'll join, I'll be a customer, I want to visit. And so this vision was really a community vision. Mm -hmm. You know, we always had a long view that we'd get land, but it was accelerated by this encouragement. And having very little savings and wanting to be close to Albany, we essentially purchased a piece of a mountainside that was completely eroded. You know, the neighbors around us shook their heads, like you cannot grow vegetables on this land. But we'd come from urban farming where you have to build up because there's lead in the soil. Mm -hmm. And we use a lot of those same techniques, which I later learned are African heritage techniques, to replenish the topsoil, to call the pollinators back in, to call the organic matter back in. And after about four years of building soil, you know, we were able to open our farm and, and have incredible produce. We feed over 300 individuals every week with a doorstep delivery program in the Capital District. It wasn't just you. This distancing from the land and from healthy food is pandemic mm -hmm. across the United States. Uh, and there was a report not so long ago from the Southern Poverty Law Center that was pretty dire in terms mm -hmm. of what people's relationship is to the land. How would you describe the problem that Soul Fire Farm is um, being the answer to? Oh my, well, it's just a tiny problem, <laughs> yeah. which is that our mission is to end racism and injustice in the food system. It concentrates the land, the power, the food into the hands of a few, and sadly, mostly European heritage folks. You know, 95% of the land is owned by white people. 
Um, if you're white, you're four times as likely to have a supermarket in your neighborhood. You're less likely to have diabetes or heart disease. Um, if you're a farm worker, you're not protected under the same laws as, as other workers in America. And so we have this institutionalized racism just baked in to the system. And it's invisible to a lot of us on the day to day. So at Soulfire, our small part is number one, steward the land the way our ancestors did and feed the people. Number two is to provide culturally relevant farm-based education for folks who want to take leadership in the food system. And the third thing is to be rabble rousers and, and change policy and change the way resources are distributed so that we have the means of production mm. to make lives on land. So you have a lot of tools in the book as well as a lot of um, history and writing. Um, what will people find in it in terms of things they can learn how to do? Well, I'm a super science nerd, so you can find all those things. Everything from vermicomposting to seed saving, if you want to know how to create a microfinance enterprise or a youth program, all the things we've learned at Soulfire, we've tried to include, so we're not gatekeepers of the knowledge. So that's one braid, it's all this practical knowledge, right? And then another braid is the story of Soulfire, which I tried to make fun and funny as it goes through all the mistakes we made, really raw and honest. And the third thing, which is where my heart swells, because I really believed as a young person going to all these totally white farming conferences that I did not belong, yeah. right? And as I was doing research for the book, I found out that quite literally every sustainable agriculture practice that I'd been exposed to had Afro-Indigenous roots. From Cleopatra's worms to George Washington Carver's cow peas bringing nitrogen into the soil to the polycultures of West Africa, I mean, it's all there. And so the third strand of this book is uplifting those stories and restoring our dignity in that narrative of sustainable agriculture. There is something of a movement happening. We were just recently at, at NISOG, and you've seen the report, uh, you were there. There is a movement, it seems, in the US and internationally, doing some of the similar sort of work that you're doing in the name of justice. Um, why now, and, and do you think it's a movement? In the, in the 20 years that I've been farming, the landscape has really shifted. You know, if when I started out, there were very few black and brown folks who were part of what we're now calling the returning generation, people whose grandparents fled the red clays of Georgia to the paved streets of Pittsburgh and Chicago. There's this sense now in our communities that we left a piece of our souls behind. And there's something aching, something missing that we can't quite name, right? That's forgotten. And, and there's a clamor now, you know, folks are like, where, how, how do I get involved? How do I find out? How do I get back to the land? And I noticed too, even in white led farming spaces, there's a wake up call in terms of the need for an equity framework. Mm -hmm. And so, so conferences that were before all white or boards that were all white are reaching out now and saying, how do we really rethink this? So we center indigenous and black people in this narrative. It's interesting where I feel myself in entering your work is around that issue of where are our lines of struggle? Yeah. Uh, if they were perhaps around the law or they were around the workplace or they were around housing segregation, um, they have now become for many of us, I think, around our lives, around the, mm. the, the, the quality of life that we are living. And at the, the, the working group on Northeast Sustainable Agriculture, a lot of people talked about hunger, mm. not just as what you, where you started about getting food, but as a more sort of spiritual thing. I mean, I love talking about that. You know, folks probably know by now if you, if you watch TED Talks that trees talk to each other, right? So Grandma Pine would not be so tall if it wasn't for her friend Mycelium, the fungus. And so she said to Mycelium one day, you know, let's make a deal. I photosynthesize, I can make sugars and you can't. And you have acids that break down rocks into liquid mineral and I can't do that. So how about I make my roots porous and we enter into this symbiosis where we share and exchange. And so there's this amazing network in the forest mm. of collaboration, of mutual aid. And my personal belief is that when you have bare feet on the soil or you have bare hand on the trees, that you get some messages about what it is to be more fully human, what it is to be in sacred community. So I completely agree with you that we are hungry. We are hungry people. Well, I'm hungry for more from you, and I hope that we will get up to the farm again soon. Thank you so much for Thank the book, you. for your work. My pleasure. And if you want to see our original piece on Soul Fire Farm, you can in our archives. And in case you've been racking your brain about who Leah reminds you of, it's Naima, her <laughs> sister, who is one half of Climbing Poetry. So you can check out her work, too. Thank you so much.